Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Tuesday, August 5th, 2014. And we are talking to Charles Murray today. Many of you know Charles Murray, who wrote the book Losing Ground, American Social Policy, 1950 to 1980, in which he argued that the stagnation in the poverty numbers was occurring not despite the federal government's war on poverty, but rather because of it. Well, you can imagine that that was just what the social science community wanted to hear, right? But that book became very, very influential. There was a 10th anniversary edition 10 years later. Very, very significant work. He's the author of numerous books. Of course, he's perhaps best known these days for having written 20 years ago the New York Times bestseller The Bell Curve, which he co-authored with Richard Hernstein of Harvard. Charles Murray holds a bachelor's degree in history from Harvard and a Ph.D. in political science from MIT. He's been at the American Enterprise Institute since 1990, and his new book, which is the subject of our conversation today, is The Curmudgeon's Guide to Getting Ahead, Do's and Don'ts of Right Behavior, Tough Thinking, Clear Writing, and Living a Good Life. Charles Murray, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. I just read to everybody the lengthy title and subtitle of, of your your book, and now I want to get into the meat of it. First of all, this is a bit of a departure for you in terms of the types of books that you write, and so I'm curious to know, I suppose I know it from reading the book, but for the sake of the audience, what is it that led you to take this path of writing a book like this? Well, it all started as a lark, really. Uh, at, at AEI, we have a uh, an intranet, which is available only to the staff, and some of my colleagues started posting a, a weekly tip on English usage, which a whole lot of the young members of the staff needed because their English leaves something to be desired. And I decided that what I would do is add on some of my pet peeves uh, as tips for how to get along in a in an office environment. Uh, for uh, for example, uh, excise the word like from your spoken English. Mm. There is nothing that drives me crazy uh, more than somebody who uses like as kind of verbal punctuation uh, as they're going along. So so for for several weeks, I had a weekly tip, uh, from, and I called it the curmudgeon guide because these were very curmudgeonly. And then after a while, I got into more serious topics and was having a wonderful time, and somebody said, make it into a book. So I did. Well, with a title like The Curmudgeon's Guide to Getting Ahead, I feel like a title like that deserves a book, in the same way that a guest I recently had on who wrote a book on The Simpsons and Economics had a title, Homer Economicus. Well, I'm afraid you have to write a book when you have a title that good. All right. right. All right. Let's start off with, I, I like to go in order. You start off talking about presenting yourself in the workplace. Very important advice right now, with the workplace being as competitive as it is, and with, frankly, I think so many young people entering the workplace for the first time being completely clueless about this. Yeah, kids don't come into the job market at 23 having started working at 8 delivering newspapers uh, the way that it... You know, I'm sorry to talk about the good old days, but that's the way it used to be. You were used to an office environment. You have a lot of 22, 23-year-olds who have never been in an office. And so you have to say to them, you know what? It's probably not a good idea to start calling the the boss of the whole organization by his first name the first time you walk into an interview. Uh, It's it's, it's probably not a good idea to show up with a visible tattoo or with uh, lots of piercings through your eyebrows. Simple stuff like that. Right now, what you're saying here is not I, I. You know, as I told you before we went on, there will be a lot of libertarians who will take offense at this. But the point of what you're saying is not to say you shouldn't have these things. Although, in my opinion, you probably shouldn't. But rather that if you want to get ahead, you don't gratuitously offend the sensibilities of the people who are going to be employing you. And chances are, these people don't want these features in an employee. In particular, they don't want somebody who right away uses the first name. I mean, I, I'm so glad that there's a book out there today that says that we've gone a little bit overboard in the casual aspect of our lives, I mean, in terms of the way we dress and the way we address each other. Yeah, Tom, and I also want to emphasize, though, that this is not advice to suck up. And in fact, the very first tip in the entire book is don't suck up. Right. 
because successful people who run a good office, they recognize it when you're sucking up to them. What I am saying is, don't do things that are automatically going to make them write you off as being hopeless. And uh, so it may not be fair that uh, a lot of curmudgeons like me look at a tattoo, and the only thing we can think of is what that's going to look like when the person who has it where it turns 60. Uh, it may not be fair that we think that way, but we do. And so deal with it. I remember back when I was in academia, one of my deans was a fairly young black woman, and she had just had a, a girl, and she named her Michelle. And she said, now you notice I didn't go out of my way to give her an African name, to give her a highly unusual name. She said, precisely because I want her to be successful, I don't want her, I don't want her very name to come off as if she's belligerent and difficult. I want her to seem just like a, a kid. And that's yeah. not because it's wrong to name people whatever you want to name them. She's just thinking in terms of what's likely to work. Now, in this first section, my eye is immediately drawn to number 11, manners at the office and in general. What do you recommend here? Well, in terms of manners, the, the, the first thing that, uh, that you want to do is, is be cheerful and show up on time and do some really basic stuff that a whole lot of your competitors in the job market uh, aren't doing these days, uh, which is to say that, you know, people, people say, how do I get noticed by the senior management? How, what kind of break do I need? What I think people don't realize is the degree to which simply having someone who shows up on time every day and is cheerful and upbeat and works hard all by itself puts you in a very small category of people. I would say that is probably about the best advice somebody can get starting out because it is for some reason, so unusual. I, I don't understand even when I'm in a retail store these days, when I know jobs are scarce, why are so many of the employees obviously extremely unhappy to be there, you, you know, in a foul mood? I mean, I would, be, <laughs> I would be as attentive to the customer as I possibly could in a market like this. Before, before going on to the next section, though, I can't help pointing out number four in your list because it, it just resonates with me. You and I have a lot of the same pet peeves. I can't stand phrases like, at the end of the day, or going forward, or a particularly detailed, a difficult one perhaps for some people to notice, but the, the word only is very often misplaced in sentences, and I yeah. notice this right away as an editor. Yeah, uh, as an editor, you will notice that. A lot of other people won't, but I'll tell you another. Let me give you another example. Reaching out. Just just think about how many times every day people talk about reaching out, and what they're saying is, I want to get in touch with somebody. I want to contact this person. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with it the first time you hear it. The 15th time you hear it, you say, look, reaching out means something like uh, you have a troubled coworker that needs needs your emotional support. Okay, that's reaching out. But just getting in touch with someone, be simple, be straightforward. Don't use the jargon. Now, in your section on thinking and writing well, you're giving, in some cases here, some good advice for people starting off as writers. And I've given some advice on that subject myself, but I'd like to hear what you have to say. You've obviously been an extremely successful writer, and I think people have a lot of misconceptions about what it takes to be a good writer, what their first steps ought to be, and so on. Yeah, now, mind you, everybody has a different style, so all I can do is to tell people how I do it. But, I, but one thing I think is pretty applicable, Tom, is your first draft is likely to be awful. My first drafts are awful. I, I, would, I would never show my first draft to anyone, because writing is a process whereby you discover what you're thinking. And in the course of doing that, you are constantly rewriting. And you're not just rewriting to make it prettier or cleaner, although that's part of it. You are rewriting mainly because as you go through that process, you're getting better ideas. Your arguments get be getting more nuanced. That's the way it happens. And just saying, oh, I'm going to put it on paper, and uh, people will be able to figure out what I mean, you know, even if it's not too elegant. They can still figure it out. That misses the whole point about why you want to write it in the first place. I like your advice, don't wait for the muse, because I think even a seasoned writer 
sometimes feels that it would be beneath him to sit down and force the words to come out. We just have to sit until the inspiration comes, but maybe it won't. You know what? If there is one thing that I think is true of just about every successful writer, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is you sit down at a given time of the day and you stare at that computer screen uh, or at the piece of paper and you do what you can. Now, even if you don't feel like it, everybody who is successful that I know of does it that way. And the reason is, it's very seldom that you suddenly say, oh, I have this wonderful paragraph I want to write. Let me rush to the computer and put it down. It happens because you have put yourself in the position where that's the work you're going to do today. Now, mind you, Tom, sometimes I just really feel dried up. And what you do then is you go back to the draft of a chapter, uh, which already is in pretty good shape, and you edit it. And you make yourself edit it, and as you're doing that, a lot of times you start to come up with new ideas again. What do you think the key step that is between going from being a pedestrian writer to being an elegant writer? How do you go from just a workaday writer to being somebody who writes these beautiful, unforgettable one-liners sometimes? Uh, and, and when I say one-liners, I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but sometimes there are writers out there who write these beautiful maxims, you know, as if they're just nothing. They just flow from their pens. Well, any time you see a, a chunk of prose that looks effortless, Chances are, well, it's like the duck paddling serenely across the pond, but paddling <laughs> furiously underneath the, the surface. Right. But one of the things that I take most pride in is that people will sometimes say of my prose, it looks so effortless, it's so simple. To, to achieve that level of simplicity requires an incredible number of rewrites. And, and the thing you have to be sensitive to is the nuances of the language. You have to love the language. Yeah. You have to be interested in the distinction between the meaning of continual and continuous. It's that kind of, of sensitivity to the capabilities of the English language that enable you to go through and say there's a better way of saying this. And also, as I said before, once there's a better way of saying it, you realize your meaning has changed as well. Now, how, I think that that's, that's a personality factor. If you don't love the language, if, if, it's, if you don't get pleasure in having said something well, maybe writing isn't what you ought to make your profession. You still have to write memos, however. You still have to write emails. You still have to communicate professionally so you can at least become workmanlike. You know, this week I've been looking at some of my essays from five to ten years ago, so they're not fresh in my mind anymore. And when I stumble upon an especially elegant sentence, I can't tell you how much pleasure it gives me. Because when I'm writing those sentences, and I know I've nailed it, and I've used the precisely correct words, and, and, and the, the, the cadence and the rhythm is just right, and it's just the right length, you know that you've done it. I think I was thinking of Thomas Sowell when I was talking about somebody who can just spit out these universal maxims as if they're just effortless. Soul has, has a beautiful prose style, and oftentimes when I recommend uh, writers to people, I say, if you want to be a better writer, you should be reading people at the caliber of a Thomas Soul, because then when you look at your own writing, you'll say, Soul would never, I mean, over his dead body, would he write a pedestrian sentence like this. Let me work at it until it has uh, a little bit more presence, let's say. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said for at the beginning of your career for dating someone whose prose you really admire. I had a mentor uh, when I was in my 20s who wrote uh, quite beautiful prose, and I just tried to imitate the way he wrote. Now, I'm sure that my imitations weren't that great the first year or two, but in the process of imitating somebody who does something very, very well, you get better yourself. And that's as true of writing as it is of carpentry or, or any other craft. I remember in high school, I felt entitled because I was the smart kid. I was going to get A's on everything. But junior year English, I was getting C's on my papers because the teacher said, the problem with your papers is you think that a lot of flowery language makes you a good writer. And it actually makes you an intolerable writer. And now I look back and I'm just mortified by what I used to write as a young man. She was absolutely right. She mercilessly cut out every unnecessary word. And that is the beginning. That's the rock-bottom beginning, absolutely necessary 
stage that you have to reach before you can progress is to get you the wordiness under control. Right, and, and the only way you get that is having a mentor, whether it's a professor in college or whether it's somebody on the job, who is merciless as they mark up your papers. Uh, and they, they, they pick on every tiny thing. Until you yourself are trying to pick on every tiny thing in your own prose, exactly. you're never going to be as good as you're going to be. And, you, and, and so intense criticism from outside at the beginning, and then internalize it uh, subsequently. Of course, that also means that it's important for you to have an open mind and not be convinced that you already are William Shakespeare. You have to know that you have a long way to go. That is the, another key step. Instead of thinking that everything you've written is already pure genius and, and elegance, it's not. And it, and it won't be, and it's normal that it's not when you're first starting out. There's sort of an ideal combination of which, which actually I'm pretty good at. I'm pretty good at uh, being incredibly self-critical during the writing phase of it uh, and the, the rewrites. I also love to reread my own stuff when it's finished. So I get enormous pleasure out of rereading things, uh, including years later. Uh, but I wait to take that satisfaction <laughs> until after the endless rounds of self-criticism. Right, 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 right. Now, in your section on the formation of who you are, your first item is just two words, leave home. Elaborate on that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're 23 years old, 22 years old, get the hell out of Dodge. Uh, you, you, you've been accustomed all your life to being supported by your parents. These days, college is not a bridge to adulthood. It's mostly prolonging adolescence and grow up. And so you've got to get out of the house. And don't tell me that you can't afford any place to live. Yeah, you can. Uh, you can get together with a couple of friends, share the rent. It just won't be as good as your parents' place, probably, but that's not the point. you got to get out. Then you say, get real jobs. Now, when you say real jobs, are yeah. you disparaging yeah. somebody who gets the simple entry-level job or the McDonald's job just to prove that he can work and be reliable? Like, What do you mean by a real job? I mean, cut out the internship stuff. Oh. Um, you know, that this business of going off to get internships at the American Enterprise Institute or Brookings or the Museum of Modern Art. I know it's very fashionable. You're supposed to be learning all this networking and stuff. You're a lot better off during the summer in college going out to uh, Glacier National Park and waiting tables for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that, that being an intern is not going to teach you how to deal with a workplace. You can't get fired if you're an intern. And you're getting paid nothing, and, and people aren't really... <laughs> They don't care whether you perform or not. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're working at a job, including waiting tables at Glacier National Park, there's somebody who is judging your performance. Uh, you are having to perform, uh, you know, do it, fill a job. That's the valuable part of, of having a job before you get into the, uh, in, into the adult workplace. Once you're in the adult workplace, you know, I... Yeah, I suppose going out and working for Habitat for Humanity or some other uh, nonprofit, it's not a bad thing to do, but I think that an awful lot of people in their 20s would be better served by working for an organization that is producing a job, a product, or a service that somebody wants to buy. Hmm. You know, that's subject to the discipline of the marketplace as opposed to a more ephemeral kind of uh, let's go out and help, help the people kind of thing. As you wrap up the curmudgeon's guide to getting ahead, you conclude with a section on the pursuit of happiness, appropriately enough. So I'm just going to throw this over to you. Of course, people should read the book, but if you had to encapsulate it, if you had to just uh, give a few bullet points that you think are the most important, that people are most likely to overlook, by the way, what would they be? Well, first thing they ought to do, Tom, is go read a book I wrote called In Pursuit, uh, which uh, talks about the pursuit of happiness in great detail. But short of doing that, there are a couple of things that uh, I want them to understand. First is, forget the money. Forget the celebrity. Yeah, I know. At the, I, I wanted to be rich and famous when I was 23, 25, 27. I understand that. 
there are two things you need to accomplish, and everything else is rounding error. One is find your soulmate. Find that person with whom your best friend, your closest confidant, the person you love to sit quietly with as well as have fun with, you do that, that's part of it. The other part is find your vocation. Find something that you love to do. And the money will take care of itself. The celebrity will take care of itself. Mainly, you'll stop worrying about that after a while. And and those are the those are the principal sources of living a satisfying life. There are two other domains I talk about, and that is the domain of faith and the domain of community. All four of those domains, family, faith, community, and vocation, are sources of deep satisfaction. Uh, you don't have to tap into all four of them. There are happy atheists, there are happy single people, but you better tap into a couple of those uh, if you're going to reach the age of 70, uh, satisfied with who you've been and what you've done. Well, I suppose after that answer, this uh, consideration is a bit mundane, but I think there are there is a concern out there among young people that this is not the economy that you and I faced years ago, that I faced in the 1990s, for example, where it seemed that all you had to do was go to college, follow the traditional path, and you were practically guaranteed a pretty good job, even with a sociology degree. You could get a good job, and you'd have a satisfying life. And today, it seems that no matter what your degree is in, I suppose engineering might be an exception, it's very, very difficult out there, and there are no guarantees. And they, people may say, this sounds like very good advice, and it might have helped me get ahead 20 years ago, but today, everything is so uncertain in the economy, it's so hard to get a stable career, that I'm not sure this is quite enough. Well, you know, in a way, I think it's a lot more important to think in terms of vocation now than it was in the 1990s. You just said it. Yeah, you, know, you could major in sociology, and you could still get a good job just because you were smart, and, and so the employer figured they could train you to do something. If you start out by saying, look, what are the kinds of things that give me satisfaction? And you, you, you start to focus in on a particular skill that you'd like to be good at, i got news for you. If it's a skill, there's probably a, a job market for that. And what you have a glut of on the market now are, quote, smart, close quote, new college graduates who don't know a damn thing that's useful. Uh, and what is really rare is a college graduate who walks into the interview something that he or she is good at. So maybe it's time to not major in sociology anymore. Well, that, of course, is a very important piece of advice. Well, the book is The Curmudgeon's Guide to Getting Ahead, Do's and Don'ts of Right Behavior, Tough Thinking, Clear Writing, and Living a Good Life by Charles Murray, our guest today. Charles Murray, thanks so much for being with us. I've enjoyed it. Thanks, Bob. All right, everybody, before I let you go, a few things. Number one, the Peter Schiff Show, it has now been made public, is no more as of later this month. It will be coming to an end later this month, August 2014. It looks, it seems likely that Peter is going to have a weekly podcast, so you'll still get to hear from him. He'll still be on TV, but his two-hour weekday program is coming to an end. So I'm deeply grateful to Peter for all the many, many hours he poured into this project, all the education that he's provided for so many people. We are deeply in Peter's debt, and I am in his personal debt for uh, having placed so much confidence in me as to make me a regular fill-in host for that program for over three years. So keep your eyes and ears open for news about Peter's forthcoming podcast. I'll certainly make mention of it here on this program. And please do subscribe to this program on iTunes or Stitcher, which you can easily do at TomWoodsRadio.com, because we give you a commute size program on some subject broadly related to liberty, Monday through Friday. So check that out at TomWoodsRadio.com. Before I get to what's coming up tomorrow, an unusual guest, certainly, uh, just a quick note, remember at LibertyClassroom.com, my website, you can get the history and economics they didn't teach you in courses you can listen to in your car, of which we have 10, not cars, but courses, over at libertyclassroom.com. Course number 11, I think, should be up and running in about a month. 
on political thought. So we got all kinds of stuff, the stuff you did not learn but should have learned, wish you learned. I sure wish I learned this in school so I didn't have to go, all, go to all the trouble of figuring out on my own. But check it out at libertyclassroom.com and take 50% off with coupon code DISCOUNT in all caps. Now, tomorrow, we're going to be talking to Jay Schaefer. I got him. I tracked this guy down. Jay Schaefer is sometimes considered, I don't know what you'd call him, not the godfather, I suppose. I don't know what the right word is, but certainly one of the key figures in the tiny house movement. The tiny house movement. Now, some of you guys have not heard of the tiny house movement. I know that. Because when I've been talking to people about this guest, only some people have recognized the subject matter. When I say tiny house, I'm talking about a house. This guy lived in a house for a long time that was 100 square feet. Why and how? What does it all mean? We're going to talk about that tomorrow on this program. So don't miss it. And if you subscribe... You are sure never to miss one of these precious gems. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.